Ready to go? Okay. Hi, everybody. My name is Dan Dyer. Um, for those of you who are watching the original schedule, you may be wondering where Matt is or if you're Matt's fan club. So uh, Matt wasn't able to attend, so I jumped in and, and uh, took his place for part of the presentation. So you get, I'm a, I'm a software architect in the HP Helion group. So you get to see me try to pretend like I'm a product manager because that was what Matt's job was. So I'll give you my best imitation of that to start with. And then um, following up after, we talk a little bit about the motivation. And we'll talk about um, Roland, who's also in the audience, who's the lead for the Manaska project. We'll talk more detail on what's going on. So you know, what's, what are we trying to do here? So everybody needs to know what's going on in their cloud. You need to be able to measure that. You need to analyze what's happening in the cloud. You need to be able to store the results of that. And then you want to see what's really going on so you can t make some conclusions. And so really that's what we're trying to do with Manaska in a very flexible, extensible way so that we can never really build out something that people can operate their clouds with because we all know that it's a bit of a challenge sometimes to operate th OpenStack clouds. Agenda real quickly, I'll, we'll do some overview, talk about some uh, use cases some, for some people who've already deployed. OpenStack and production environments, and then talk a little bit about kind of next steps where we're going as far as Manaska. So first of all, let's talk about the monitoring challenges. Um, there are a lot of tools out there. Everybody's doing the monitoring for, I've been working in monitoring off and on for 25 years. We all know there's a, as many tools out there as there's probably people that use them. They're, they're all over the map in terms of capabilities, but if you look at you know, traditional tools that have been developed versus the cloud environment and where we're moving, some of the things that are starting to come to the forefront in the way we manage and deploy clouds starts to make some of those other tools kind of maybe not quite the best fit. So first of all, you know, you're talking about scale increasing. So, you know, in a typical enterprise environment, you compare that to, say, a cloud environment where you've got thousands of, potentially thousands in a large enterprise or even a public cloud um, compute nodes, volumes, things like that. And then you've got hundreds of thousands potentially of virtual machines or containers. You know, that's just not the kind of scale that a lot of systems know how to deal with at this point. Second is there's just a lot more moving parts and things are a lot more complicated. You know, we're just in the last year or so, containers have kind of taken off. So people are, a lot of enterprises are just getting used to VMs and now we're throwing containers into the mix. A lot of different types of resources to deal with with the virtualized resources and shared resources that you have in the cloud, that just adds another layer of complexity when you're trying to figure out what's really going on. Um, the apps themselves are distributed. So where you used to have kind of monolithic apps that you built vertically, now you're distributing those. You start looking at a cloud native app kind of architecture where the pieces are moving around. They're all over the network, potentially all over your multiple networks to give you the kind of fault tolerance and and uh, resonance you need. So once again, very good for the reliability and the capabilities of the app, but really hard to keep track of and monitor. And then more and more, you know, you're expected to do more with less, so got to automate everything. Okay, so what happens when you do automation? Well, you know, you don't exactly always know what's going on. Unintended side effects, things like that. So once again, you need something that can keep up with the level of automation so you know what's going on in your environment. And then because we're talking about virtualized resources and things like that, there's a lot more transiency in a, in a cloud environment than there was in, say, our old typical enterprise environments. You know, VMs going up and down, workloads moving around, being optimized and changed on the fly. Things are scaling up and down automatically. You know, that puts a lot of load on the monitoring system to be able to figure out what's really going on, what's an error, what's actually intended to happen, you know, when are you checking things? When are you actually evaluating that, you know, we scaled up or down because we had to or because there was a problem? And then all of that needs a lot of data. So we need to be able to react quickly. We need fine grain sampling and we need to be able to do that over a large number of different things that we're monitoring. So we're generating a lot of data. So those are kind of the challenges. There's lots more too, but those are the big ones. And that kind of drove a lot of what we're looking at as far as how we design Manaska and what we have been working on. So process kind of um, discussion here. You know, you're, you're, you're a typical admin, 
Everything's good. You're running along nice and happy, and something blows up. So first thing you got to do is you got to know that something blew up. And hopefully you know that before the, all of your customers know that so that they're not all pissed off at you. Um, typical, though, you know, so our, in, in HP and Helion, we target private cloud. And so we're going to probably be in an enterprise that already has some processes and capabilities to manage this with their more traditional data center stuff or even with their virtualized things. So they probably have some kind of incident management system. So once you've detected the problem and you know that there's an issue, you've done some basic triage to figure out that there's a problem there, then you, you're going to go into an incident management system, some job ticketing potentially, and identify that there's a problem and somebody needs to fix it and it gets routed through your normal support process. So that the, the poor engineer has to go figure out what's going on now has to go in and say, okay, not only what's wrong, but how important is this relative to all the other stuff I, go, I have going on? So they need to do a little bit of impact analysis, prioritize it, get it upset right, and then finally, hopefully solve the problem, get back into that nice happy state. The diagram on the right, what we're trying to show here is that you know, OpenStack is not an island. It has to be able to work with everything else that's in the customer's environment. Manaska is not the only thing that they're going to be using to monitor the systems. You know, everybody's going to have a job ticket system. They'll probably have some massive dashboard that they're looking at things. So you got to be able to fit into whatever processes and capabilities they already have there so that they're not expected to just go rip everything out and put something new in there. So how does Manaska help with this? So the feature set and the capabilities, the architecture that we built out is really was focused around that problem set that we're talking about. So first of all, it's got to scale out architecture. So Roland will talk about this a little more, but essentially you have to be able to grow with your cloud, your monitoring system. And, it's, and really from our perspective, you have to be able to grow so that you can have everything in one place so that as you're processing that data, you have a holistic view of what's going on. If you can grow, but you end up with little silos of what's happening in your environment, then it's going to be tough to figure out what's going on. Second is... Because people expect very quick response and they expect to have things up and running and you're running a lot of automation and things are sensitive to timing, you really need the high resolution metrics. So you gotta be able to pick this data up quickly and you gotta be able to process it quickly. Obviously, if you're gonna depend on this and this is your mission critical infrastructure, that's gotta be HA. Um, one of the things that a lot of traditional tools don't do very well is multi-tenancy. So, while operators are always the first line of defense in, a, in an operating environment, and they're the ones that are going to be the first ones who get the interest in the monitoring tools, you know, if you look in a DevOps kind of environment, the DevOps people are going to be maintaining the in-cloud workloads, and they also need to be able to see this. You may not necessarily want your DevOps guy, though, to see the underlying infrastructure of your system or see everything that's going on under there, especially if it's a, you know, a public cloud kind of scenario. So having multi-tenancy in that capability so that I can filter out who sees what but make that available to different categories of consumers, people running VMs versus people running infrastructure, applications, that, that's a pretty powerful capability that really hasn't been done very well in the past. Um, anything that we do also, as I mentioned, first of all, has to fit into the rest of the environment. So we got to be able to do integration. So as an example, you know, we've done a variety of integrations with some existing HP software products. We've done integration with PagerDuty, you know, job ticketing systems. Those kinds of things are going to want the information that, HP ha that the um, monitoring tool has, and they're going to want to be able to process on it. So you've got to be able to integrate with it. And then you have to be able to extend that, because what's cool today and what we just did, you don't want to go ripping everything out so that you can throw in a new thing next week that does something new. You want to be able to incrementally build on your capabilities. So we have an architecture that can form the basis of this. It's very flexible in deployment and capabilities, but also can be extended. And through the community, people are starting to build on top of that. If you guys saw the logging um, presentation that was just done, that was done by Fujitsu. A lot of the work was done totally independently, and we pulled that together to make it look like it's fitting very well because we had some nice design patterns, some integrations. But that gives you the idea of, you know, if you're doing things custom just to your environment, you can do that. Or if you want to build that so that the community can use it, they, all those extensibility points are there. 
And then finally, a lot of the systems out there are kind of static. Um, you try to have, if anybody's tried to configure Isinga, for example, it's not exactly easy to go into Isinga and change that thing on the fly. So all of the configurability, all the capabilities in Manaska are, you can run that through an API, you can dynamically control the behavior of the system so that your automation can go in and quickly change things if you want to. You don't have to go restarting services, loading config files in places, things like that. So that's the sort of the rationale and overview. So now I'm going to hand this over to Roland to talk about more de technical detail. Uh, hello, everyone. So I'm Roland Hockmuth. I'm the tech lead on the Manaska project. Uh, I'm going to go through the system architecture of Manaska first. And when I get to the next slide, I'll tell you what's next, I guess. <laughs> OK, so let's see. So very Zen-like, open mind. Um, OK, so up in the upper right here, we have the system being monitored. We typically have an agent deployed on that system. Uh, that's monitoring things like system metrics, CPU utilization, networking, et cetera. It can also monitor services like RabbitMQ, Apache MySQL. That agent will uh, publish to our Manask API, which is a REST API. We publish metrics. Um, from the, the API, the um, metrics are published to our Kafka message queue. So we use uh, Apache Kafka as our message queue. Um, most people are familiar with RabbitMQ in the OpenStack community. Uh, Kafka was developed by LinkedIn. It's highly performant, scalable, fault tolerant, and durable message queue. Uh, can handle millions of messages per second in a completely uh, durable way. OK, so those metrics end up in our message queue. And then we have several components here. Uh, my diagram is only showing three components today. Uh, often when I show this in the past, I've had maybe four or five components. But the first component of this diagram is our persister. It consumes message metrics from our message queue and then publishes them to our metrics and alarms database in the lower right-hand corner. There's actually two di uh, databases in our system here. One in the bottom right is for all of our high volume uh, data, which is uh, metrics, could be events, uh, it could be log messages. In this case, it's metrics. Um, then the next component in the middle there is the threshold engine. Uh, the threshold engine is written in Apache uh, Storm. Uh, so this is also a highly distributed component. Uh, and what it does is it evaluates whether metrics have exceeded some thresholds, which is user configurable. You can specify the alarms. We, we support compound alarms made up of many alarm sub-expressions. And each sub-expression is you know, whether some value of a metric is greater, or less than, or equal to something. If that threshold is exceeded, then we publish an alarm state transition back to our message queue. The notification engine, uh, sort of in the lower, not the lower left, but above the database there, will then look at those alarm state transitions and evaluate whether it should send an email or a pager duty alert, or um, it could also uh, send events to other software systems via webhooks. Okay. Uh, the lower right, our config database, that's MySQL. That's where we store all of our configuration information. Some people are probably wondering, why do you have two databases in this system? Isn't one enough? Um, so some databases are really good at storing lots of data, write once, read many times. Uh, that's, those are database, you know, like analytics type databases. Uh, and in this diagram, that would be InfluxDB. Uh, we also support a database called Vertica from HP. We're working on support for Cassandra. The lower right database, that's typically MySQL, also Postgres. Uh, Fujitsu uh, added support for Postgres uh, recently. Uh, and that stores information like, what are all the alarms that you've created and the notifications that you've created in the system? Uh, the upper left-hand port, uh, upper left there is Horizon. 
and we have a monitoring dashboard that we've developed for Horizon that uh, does all the create, read, update, and delete operations uh, via uh, our API. And then we have a Python client. Okay, so the advantages, I'm not going to go through all the advantages today of the architecture, but some of the more important ones. Uh, so this is a microservices message bus architecture. That's what we like to call this. Microservices, relatively new in the industry the last couple of years. Uh, you can see we have small components. Uh, they can be deployed autonomously. They communicate over a network, in this case uh, over a message queue via well-defined APIs. You can deploy Manasco with all those components there, or you can even add additional ones. Um, so that's a little bit about microservices. Uh, um, so system supports load balancing, scalability, and system maintenance. What I mean by that is if, you date, if your amount of data that you're sending into the systems is exceeding your current uh, capacity, you can easily add in and scale out horizontally more components. Um, also, it's really important when you're developing a monitoring system is you have a requirement for 100% uptime or fairly close to that. And what you can do in the system is take the database offline if you want, plop a new database down or deploy a new one, and your queue will have stored all that data. Hopefully this doesn't take too long for you to deploy the database. And, uh, and then you can enable a new database and start sending data into it. Or if components fail, they will end up being stored in the queue. And then later on, when the components come back online, they will then catch up. Um, so data in Kafka, typically durability, uh, time to live on messages within the queue. You can typically support days if you'd like. So you could take systems down for days at a time. Um, so highly available, uh, and durability ensures no data loss. The system is extensible. And this is really important, the extensibility aspect. Diane mentioned a little bit of this. But it's easy to add new components. Uh, within HP, we've had you know, a lot of s several monitoring solutions that we've developed over the years. One is called HP Operations Manager OMI. There is a connector for that. I'm not trying to give a plug for HP here, but I am trying to just point out that it's easy to do these integrations. There's another one tool that we have done, a proof of concept one as well of HP called Ops Analytics. You think of Ops Analytics as a little more similar to something like Splunk. Uh, something that came up uh, when Time Warner Cable was deploying Manasca is they wanted to do multi-site replication of their data. That was very easy for them to do that because they, they just enabled uh, another component to send the data to a uh, database that was off-site. Uh, anomaly detection, I showed this last year at the Paris Summit, but you could add in more components. So we have had some proof of concept of anomaly detection being done. Okay, so the threshold engine. Uh, the threshold engine is a real-time, in-memory streaming threshold engine. That means as the, the, as the threshold engine consumes metrics from the queue, it keeps them in memory for the entire time frame or window that it requires those metrics for. It doesn't uh, go out and query another API or database when it needs to update those um, thresholds. So we're updating thresholds uh, once a minute is our default uh, time today. Um, you can send metrics into the system much faster than once a minute, but we evaluate thresholds on one minute intervals. And uh, that's just basically kept in memory uh, when we no longer need a metric, uh, then it just drops out of the window. And we don't have to uh, query databases or other APIs. And that's based on Apache Storm. Okay, this is just an example of a metric. So posting to the V2 metrics endpoint. Metric is composed of a name, in this case, CPU user percent. We have dimensions. Uh, dimensions are whatever values you'd like to have in there. But uh, in this example, a host name, a region, a zone, and a service. There's a timestamp in milliseconds, a value, which is a float. And then this thing called value meta, which we added to better support Nagio. So we we have a compatibility with Nagios. If you have a bunch of Nagios plugins deployed already, you can use our agent 
to run those Nagios plugins, convert the status codes into metrics, which is a value of 0, 1, 2, or 3 for OK, warning, cr uh, critical, or unknown. And what's even, uh, it's also important is the message that goes along with that. And that's what the value meta is there. Uh, showing two things in this uh, value meta, the status code 400 in this case, HTTP 400 status code, and uh, a message of internal server error. And that's all, again, up to whatever values you'd like to store there. Okay, typical deployment scenario, we, we typically, you know, within HP, even focused on Helion, uh, but we, we deploy on three nodes. Um, and in this example, it's for like, it's symmetric. All the components are deployed across the entire three nodes, which I'm showing as availability zones in this diagram. And then there's a load balancer with VIPs. So a fairly uh, common pattern for deploying. Uh, if any one of those nodes goes down, uh, the system stays up and running. And then when that node comes back online, you can have it re rejoined in the cluster. Uh, and we've done a lot of testing with that, so we know that it works. And that's the guy to talk to right there. <laughs> like, all right, so our agent, uh, it's, it's a Python agent. It's optional, uh, but uh, typically you would use our agent for running with Anaska. It does, um, collects large amounts of data. Uh, like system metrics or service metrics or application metrics. We have a built-in stats D daemon. So if you want to, um, uh, you know, use a import like a stats D library, we also have our own stats D library. Uh, import that and then start sending application metrics by instrumenting your application. Then you could do that. We support VM metrics via Libvirt. Uh, we do active checks as well. So HTTP status checks, system up down checks. Uh, typically, you don't want to do those checks on the system that you're monitoring. You want to do those from another system and maybe multiple systems if you're trying to uh, monitor multiple paths uh, to an API endpoint, for example. We can run any Nagios plugin or check MK, and it's very extensible. This is the agent architecture. Uh, important things here. It has several com components. As well, uh, so we have a collector. Collector is the component that goes off and gets things like system or service metrics. It sends, and that typically runs, uh, we, we run usually every 30 seconds, uh, and that's configurable as well. But that will send to a forwarder, which buffers for a small period of time to amortize the cost of the HTTP request. Uh, so the forwarder will authenticate with Keystone, uh, cache that token, and buffer metrics and send to the API uh, around every seven seconds is the default that we use. Uh, and then we're showing the stats D daemon down there as well, an application sending that. We have a UI. Uh, we have a Horizon dashboard. Uh, not, I'll have some diagrams there later. We'll show you. Actually, I don't think I have any screenshots here of the dashboard. Um, sorry about that. But um, it, it, that supports basic the create, read, update, delete type operations via our API. So you can create alarms uh, within the UI. You can look at the stat state of alarms. You can look at the history. Uh, you can get the overall view and health of your uh, services. And then there's a very uh, cool time series dashboard called Grafana that's out there. We've supported that for over a year now. Uh, so that provides visualization of metrics. And there is a port to Grafana 2.0 in progress by Time Warner Cable. And that code is posted at that link. It was just posted yesterday, I believe. OK, so talk about production use cases next. Um, and I'm going to talk about uh, Manaska at Time Warner Cable. Uh, Time Warner Cable is one of our closest partners. They have around 200 physical nodes in their infrastructure. It's all being monitored with Manaska today, around 3,000 metrics per second. Uh, so the agent is deployed on other nodes. It's doing all the physical infrastructure monitoring. And uh, I mentioned the Nagios part. So they actually enabled, they had Nagios deployed already in their environment. And what they're in the process of doing is switching over to using just solely Manaska. 
Uh, so they basically enabled all those Nagios plugins within our Manaska agent. And the goal here is a big part of our own Manaska was to consolidate systems. I worked on public cloud for HP, and we deployed three systems for our monitoring there. We had Nagios, we had monitoring as a service, and we have an internal metrics processing system. One of the goals in Manaska was to replace those three systems with one, and that's um, I didn't mention that earlier, but the consolidation aspect was very important to us. Uh, so we had a fairly large team as a monitoring group. We had around 15 people, so four on each service, roughly. Um, and so now with just four people, we can handle all that. Uh, we replace three systems with essentially one group. Okay, so next thing, self-service. Okay, so there are... Uh, TWC is also doing monitoring as a service. So VMs are being monitored and other resources um, in that data. It's, this is not, I think this is in beta right now internally. And um, they're, um, they're, they're gonna hopefully move to Grafana 2.0 since they're the ones that are running it. Those two people in that diagram there, one is Brad Klein, he uh, works on the NASCA and he's responsible for deploying there. And the guy in the back is David Medbury, who also works at Time Warner Cable. Okay, so uh, this is just one of their dashboards. This is a Grafana dashboard. Uh, and this showing the, um, just their overall service um, resource utilization, so like Nova resource count, neutron resource count, Cinder resource count, and various other aspects. Um, so that's a dashboard that they developed. And this is a dashboard that they have for uh, the tenant or the project monitoring. So this is more of the, uh, what the tenant users would see. We've done a lot of analysis on Manasco over the past year. Most recently, we've done analysis, or we've been doing analysis from day one. Uh, but most recently, we've done analysis within our Helion distribution. This analysis here is, so it's really focused on what we're doing with Helion. Uh, we have a three node shared control plane that's fully clustered and we run Manask and all the OpenStack services there. Uh, in this environment, we, were, we had 100 compute nodes, around 40 VMs per host for 4,000 total VMs. That translated into 4,600 metrics per second that were being sent to the Manaska API. There were thousands of alarms. And we also simulate a load of automatically creating VMs, tearing them down because VM churn is fairly common and creating VMs is one of the more expensive operations. Well, it, it adds an extra load on the system, so we wanted to test that as well. And we also had uh, logging and salometer deployed on that same control plane. So the key findings in this case, um, so Monasca is stable, that's good news. Uh, all components performed within our tolerance level. The main takeaway is that Monasca only used three CPU cores. And, and on these servers that we were running, we had 48 cores total, hyper-threading was enabled. So we're counting cores times two there. So 48, so we use three out of 48. That's roughly 6% of the total utilization on the control plane, and around six gigabytes of memory. Uh, we can scale much higher than those numbers, I can assure you, and, but this is what I you know, want to report on here. Okay, so what's next for Manaska? Uh, yesterday, there was a talk by Fabio Gennetti from Cisco. He talked about Salaska, uh, which is a combination of Salometer and Manaska. One thing that Salometer does very well is it sends, uh, it, it does data collection for OpenStack resources and will send samples or events into a system. So on the left here, going from left to right, we're showing the Salometer system uh, sending um, samples or events into the Salometer agent. And there's a box there, the Manaska publisher, which is just within Salometer is the multi-publisher interface. So the Manaska publisher is an implementation of that. 
and that publishes to our Minosk API where we store the data as metrics. And then what we've also done is uh, developed a storage driver for the Salometer V2 API. So that's on the right, the Minosk driver. So when you query Salometer, it'll go through the Minosk driver and essentially we're using Minosk as a database. And the performance numbers there are really good. Uh, I encourage you to take a look at those. Uh, in terms of being able to send data around three times faster than uh, the current uh, MongoDB-based system. And for queries, uh, what we've been measuring is up to 18 times faster. Uh, and all the details, there's a lot of information in the presentation that was done yesterday, so I just wanted to expose you to that. Okay, events as a service is something that's also in progress. Uh, let me mention one other thing. That code for Salaska is available in a repo, so if people want to start using that, um, that is available. Okay, so events as a service is in progress. One of our use cases is we want to get OpenStack notifications, and uh, we might want to calculate. My canonical example is calculate the elapsed time between when a VM is first created and when it is active. Let's just say that average is two minutes. And that's kind of a, a good metric to have in your system. It tell, tells you when things are starting to go wrong, if that value starts going up to three or four minutes. You know, your system could be misconfigured, networking could be bad, et cetera. So, um, so with events as a service, we want to get those events. We will do complex events uh, processing on that. So we'll filter events, uh, we'll, we'll transfer them, transform them, we will filter them, we will group them, and then we will do processing when various criteria occurs. And there's two components within Minosk, uh, in addition to the API there, there's the uh, events transform engine and the events engine itself, which does the stream, complex stream processing. Logging as a service was just discussed by Fujitsu right before this presentation. Um, uh, so the idea there, one of the big use cases that we're thinking, um, or we're trying to target, is basically take logs and have them ultimately result in metrics. Like I can count the number of errors that are in my log file over some time period and have that result in a metric. Okay, so there's three components there: a log API, a log transformer, a log persister. Um, you should see a similar pattern as I go through this, right? We went metrics, events, logging, right? Very similar. Uh, similar components, similar things happening. Okay, so this is the data flow. Um, so we got logs way on the left, logs going uh, into our message queue, which is essentially a message bus. We do some log processing on it, and we transform them. And then they can end up as events in our events engine, which we'll create metrics with. From there, they can go to our threshold engine, which we can alarm on. Alarms can then result in notifications. So this is the big picture where we're headed. This is not all available today. Uh, for those people that are developers that want to get involved, this is uh, trying to show just the vision for the project right now. The metric stuff is in great ship. Events and logging is in progress. All right, so putting it all together, just another view of how this all looks to kind of show you more of an architectural view versus a more of a data flow view. Going left to right again, we have our log system, events in the middle, and metrics. Um, and then just emphasizing similar technology, similar architecture and design patterns. But more important than architecture and design patterns is the overall vision of being able to take logs and have them result in metrics. Okay, project status. Uh, I mentioned Time Warner Cable, so they, uh, they were one of the early adopters of Minosca, and we've worked very closely with them over the past six months, so it's in production there. Uh, HP um, has integrated Minosca in a product called Cloud System. That was released the end of October, early September. Nine dot, cloud System 9.0 was released. So we're the monitoring solution for Cloud System. We're also the monitoring solution for Helion now. 
So the big announcement yesterday uh, from HP about Helan, we were in that. Um, I, I, I don't want to, you know, this is an open source community. I'm talking about these things to give examples. Uh, so um, there is a community around Minasca consisting of those six companies. Uh, and obviously Fujitsu has done great work with the logging side of things, and they're also looking at deploying Minasca within the products that they are building out, and Cisco is also looking at that as well. So lots of uh, activities are going on. Um, obviously, we'd like to grow that community. Uh, also, status for the project itself, we're targeting to be in the big tent in November. Uh, so uh, hopefully in a couple more weeks, uh, OpenStack will be up for review again and the technical committee will approve us. That would be awesome if that happened. And uh, we, we're one of our final um, criteria uh, prior to that review is that Minasca be in the OpenStack uh, CI systems and that's in progress. So we have, uh, we have a dev stack integration for Minasca, so you can run dev stack, and we have a Minasca plugin for dev stack, so you can basically get that up and running. Uh, and uh, we have Tempest tests that have been developed. So with those two pieces, uh, we started the, the integration into the CI system, and that's occurring right now. So thank you, everyone. Uh, we're I think we are got a few minutes, so I guess we can take some questions, right? We have, I think, four minutes. Okay. Uh, questions, anyone? And there's a mic right there. One question. Maybe two. Actually, I have a big question. Uh, I'm wondering the relationship between Manaska and the Silometer. And uh, I have listened to the, the presentation yesterday about the Silometer and the Manaska. Uh, you replaced the, the Silometer storage driver with, with the Manaska, mm -hmm. and the Silometer API can call the Manaska API to, to do the uh, to to get the to get the, the data, and uh, so I think and and the Snowmeter also have the alarm alarm metric alarm the the function, and uh, Manaska also have have this have this. Mm -hmm. So so I so I'm wondering if uh, Manaska and Snowmeter can do some merge or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so there are two separate projects. Yeah. Uh, and so there's, there are areas of low overlap. Um, and alarming is one example. Uh, right now, their alarm engine isn't capable of the performance and scale that yeah. we're actually driving. So, uh, you know, we have a different API, um, yeah. but um, we didn't go a lot into the differences there, but our the API is different. And the way we do things is a little bit different. So, and there's good justifications for doing that. Um, so we see Solometer uh, as, you know, more of a telemetry system. It acquires data and then feeding that data into our system. And then we have the very scalable and performant monitoring system. So. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, have you had any idea about integration of Oslo messaging so that it could write data directly to Manaska? Uh, we, we talked about it, but we haven't really thought about it too much. Okay. Um, so. um, how about uh, Apache, Storm, uh, Apache Spark integration? Yeah, that's a topic that's coming up for us. Um, so our threshold engine, right, that's typically where we think about it, the threshold right. engine. So we use uh, Storm today, and that uh, is written in, uh, that's our only component that is still in Java. Uh, and we'd like to report that to Python as well, and Spark 
uh, is, is an interesting one because Spark supports Python very well. Uh, PySpark. Yes. PySpark. Yeah. yeah. And they uh, support a streaming engine. Right. So Spark streaming. Right. Uh, so, so um, we, I mean, we have to look at it further to understand that, see if that makes sense. We'd like to be able to go from, you know, from the same, you know, in the simpler deployments where maybe you only have, you know, 10 or 20 systems, you don't need Spark there. So we'd like to be able to go from a system that doesn't involve uh, some of these um, more complex frameworks uh, and use the same code in those frameworks when you finally do scale. And we think that's possible, but we still need to write the code to see how it'll translate. Okay. Uh, so you say you have millisecond resolution uh -huh. on your timestamps. Yeah. Um, uh, are you targeting uh, like real time or near real time data analysis? You know, something that could be enabled with Spark. And if so, yeah. do you see that having to go through a RESTful API before you get to the message queue is causing uh, a delay in being able to process that data in, an, in sort of a near real time? I mean, so if the data went directly into Kafka, mm -hmm. then you could pull that data off uh, very, very right. quickly instead of having to go through an extra hop. Mm -hmm. Have you noticed that it's adding a, a time lag there? Yeah, well, so we do a little bit of buffering to amortize that HTTP overhead. So we do right. add, add a delay. Uh, so we're not trying to, we haven't really targeted, you know, sub-second sort of res, um, analysis okay. with no delays. Uh, you know, you, you could theoretically go directly to the Kafka queue uh, if you had a need to do that, deploy Minoska, and then if you had something internal that you want to monitor, you could do that. Right. The message formats themselves, we, our schemas are published in our wiki. Uh, so if you want to understand what we published to Kafka in terms of metrics uh, and other events like alarm state transitions, you could look at that and then you could write your own consumer and, you know, if you want to send that data into Spark, you could do that pretty easily. Okay. Thank you. <coughs> okay. Uh, I think our time is basically up. If people have more questions, uh, get with me or Dan. We have a few of the Fujitsu guys back there as well, Martin Ruderis. Uh, and we're going to do a session on uh, Manaska at uh, 4, 440 in the Sakura Tower in room S3. Uh, so that's just a they get together for the Manaska folks, but everyone can attend that. Uh, I'm hoping that all of you don't attend that because I don't think we have a very big room. <laughs> but, <laughs> uh, but for people that, you know, it's mainly more focused on the developers, right? So people want to uh, get involved in the project, want to meet us and talk to us, ask more questions, uh, welcome to do that. And I'll be around tomorrow as well. Uh, as the other folks are available, if they want to get together with us, we should be able to do that. Thank you very much.